Interviews abruptly canceled. Angry and extreme outbursts about his critics. Diatribes about everything from world leaders to sharks and fictional serial killers. 18 days to Election Day here in the United States and concerns they are mounting about the mental acuity of the oldest presidential nominee in American history. And the red flags, they are being raised not just by the media or by Democrats. Donald Trump's own allies, they are now worried about his ability to stay on track. The New York Times reporting, quote, at a time when his opponent, Vice President Kamala Harris, has stepped up her attacks on him as unstable, Mr. Trump has struggled to publicly hone his message by veering off script and ramping up personal attacks on Ms. Harris that allies have urged him to rein in. Veering off script? Well, that may be an understatement. This, what you are about to watch, just from the past week. Should Google be breaking up? I just haven't gotten over something the Justice Department did yesterday, where Virginia cleaned up its voter rolls and got rid of thousands and thousands of bad votes, and the Justice Department sued them that they should be allowed to put those bad votes and illegal votes back in and let the people vote. So I haven't, I, I haven't gotten... I haven't gotten over that. A lot of people have seen that. They can't even believe it. The question is about Google, President Trump. If my guys can hear me, two things. Put up the chart, my favorite chart. <laughs> my all-time favorite chart. And let's listen to Pavarotti sing Ave Maria. Because Biden was obviously cognitively repaired. She should have reported him because that puts our nation in danger. We've never been so close to being in World War III than we are right now. And don't kid yourself, we have an election coming up, but we still have like three and a half months left. And it's a long time in a nuclear world. And uh, that would be a war like no other. And I'm not thrilled about the people representing us, even for a short period of time. The election was three and a half weeks away, not months, when he said that. And if the endless series of non sequiturs, outbursts, nonsensical answers wasn't strange enough, Donald Trump has become downright flaky as the presidential campaign gets down to the wire. From Politico, quote, it's become something of a pattern. Trump is scheduled for an interview with a neutral media outlet. The date nears and then things fall apart. It happened just this week to planned Trump sit downs with NBC in Philadelphia and CNBC's Squawk Box. And that's on the heels of him backing out of a 60 Minutes episode earlier this month. According to Team Trump, their candidate is exhausted. More from Politico, quote, the Trump campaign had been in conversations for weeks with the shade room about a sit-down interview. The site, which draws an audience that is largely young and black, hosted an interview with Harris just last week. In a conversation earlier this week when describing why an interview had not come together just yet, a Trump advisor told the shade room producers that Trump was, quote, exhausted and refusing some interviews, but that could change at any time. But not too tired for his favorite network and his favorite morning show. Here he is on Fox and Friends, where he had to say stuff like this. Well, Lincoln was probably a great president, although I've always said, why wasn't that settled? You know, I'm a guy that it doesn't make sense. We had a civil war. Well, half the country uh, left before he got there. Yeah, yeah. But you'd almost say, like, why wasn't that... As an example, Ukraine would have never happened in Russia if I were president. The weave, you know. An exhausted Donald Trump also somehow found time for a podcast with Fox News star Dan Bugino when th where this happened. I'm just a, just a slight tad bit younger, but you remember 1980s Times Square pre-Giuliani? Yeah. You know, remember the Folexes, the fake Rolexes, yeah. and then yeah. all the peep shows and stuff? I mean, some of the scammers were good. Remember the Shell Game guys? That's like, right. they were good. Like, so right. that's them. Like, if you're going to be good at a scammer, you might as well be good at it. That's the, what 60 The press is a big scam. Oh, it's it's terrible. It's, you know, I don't know that a country can come back if it has a fake press. It's hard. Because they're like the policemen. You know, they're like, they keep people honest, right? But... Democrats don't have to be honest. They really don't have to be honest because they're not going to, they will never be accused of anything. It's interesting. Uh, I was so amazed that Harvey Weinstein got schlonged. He got hit as hard as you can get hit because he was sort of the king of the world, right? Yeah. And yet he got hit. And I figured that maybe he wouldn't get hit so hard. But boy, did he get, uh, you don't know him well. I don't know him well. I Ah, yes, Harvey Weinstein, well-known king of the woke. But don't worry, 
Donald Trump, he says he is just fine. I am the most stable human being. Remember they said uh, a stable genius. I am the most stable <laughs> human being. I've been doing this for a long time. And that, all that, is where we start today. MSNBC political analyst Mara Gay joins us. She's editorial board member with The New York Times. Plus, Reverend Al Sharpton is here. He is the host of MSNBC's Politics Nation and president of the National Action Network. And this weekend, he's going to be interviewing Vice President Kamala Harris in Atlanta. We're going to talk more about that forthcoming interview a little later on. Also with us, MSNBC columnist and contributor Charlie Sykes and NBC News correspondent Vaughn Hilliard. All right, Vaughn. Um, 19 days to Election Day. Trump is on TV saying Abraham Lincoln should have cut a deal to avoid the Civil War. He goes on a podcast to talk about how prosecutors threw the book at Harvey <clears throat> Weinstein. Just did I get all that right? Is that where we are? I, I think that that's pretty accurate. There's not exactly a campaign focus, largely because the candidate himself doesn't stay focused on one specific message. And, you, you know, his reference to somehow Abraham Lincoln should have settled the before the Civil War started between the Union and the Confederacy, of course, what exactly would a settlement look like? Would that include slavery? The best effort was the Crittenden Compromise, which would have added a constitutional amendment that would have allowed the South to maintain slavery. And so Donald Trump, though, you know, also in the Fox and Friends appearance, he was talking about that Kamala Harris would supposedly ban cows and get rid of cows, which is just a misrepresentation of the Green New Deal. But this is where you see the Republican nominee just over two weeks out, despite sometimes the best efforts of his campaign to build events around focused around immigration or the economy, their candidate has a much different tenor. And just to underscore, the media interviews that he decides to do are podcasts that are very friendly towards him, but also the likes of Fox and Friends, which we should note, that type of interview that played out this morning was a stark contrast to the one that the Vice President Harris did with Brett Baer just 48 hours ago. So, more, I want to correct myself. I said 19 days. It is 18 days. We all have the right to misspeak. There's the misspeaking, and then there is the exhaustion. If you're too exhausted to talk to the shade room, are you potentially too exhausted to be President of the United States? Oh, well, right. I mean, what Vaughn is identifying here is it's not just an issue for the campaign that Donald Trump is veering off script. I think a central issue that he has in, in making this closing argument is he isn't going to win with just his base. And much of the appeal of Trumpism that I hear uh, when I talk to voters that we see in polls is this, and I think it's a false idea, but this idea that he's strong, that he projects strength and leadership, mm -hmm. and this idea that he's an outsider and that a vote for him is uh, a rational choice for Americans who somehow feel disaffected by the political system. Now, I don't believe that Donald Trump actually has solutions for those Americans, but that is a large part of the appeal that you hear when you talk to voters at rallies and on the trail. The problem is, that the reality of Donald Trump himself and who he is, is of course just none of those things. Um, he's a threat to democracy. He has nothing to offer the American people other than uh, more, you know, grift um, for his own benefit in the next four years. And I think the more we hear from Donald Trump himself on the trail, the more obvious that becomes to voters. It's harder to really takes seriously this notion that he would be a strong leader or that he somehow cares about Americans who feel like the political system hasn't served them when you actually listen to what he's saying. So he is really his own worst enemy on the campaign trail, which is not the closing argument that you need in a close race 18 days out from Election Day. Joining me now is John D. Miller, former chief marketer for our sister network, NBC. This week, he wrote in U.S. News & World Report about his regret leading the team that marketed The Apprentice. Also joining me is Tim O'Brien, senior executive editor of Bloomberg Opinion and an MSNBC political analyst and pal of the show. Thank you both for being here. It's great to meet you, Mr. Miller. I want to read you to yourself. I'm going to read you to okay. you. You wrote this. You wrote... 
We created a monster. Trump was a TV fantasy invented for The Apprentice. At NBC, we promoted the show relentlessly. Thousands of 30-second promo spots that spread the fantasy of Trump's supposed business acumen were beamed over the airwaves to nearly every household in the country. The image of Trump that we promoted was highly exaggerated. In fact, Trump declared business bankruptcy four times before the show went into production and at least twice more during the, his 14 seasons hosting. The imposing boardroom where he famously fired contestants was a set because the real board Boardroom was too old and shabby for TV. I also learned from working with him that he has questionable judgment. At the wrap party for The Apprentice season three, he pitched an idea for the upcoming season. This is wild. He told me we should make a team of black players compete against white players. My first thought was, WTF. Yes. <laughs> Talk a little bit about the way that, the, the, that Trump was in reality versus the Trump that people saw on the show. Well, uh, what you see right now is sort of what he was in reality. Um, he was, to a large degree, um, someone who was an entertainer. He really was not a good businessman. Our job is, from a marketing perspective, for the conceit of the show, was to make it seem like he was a legitimate businessman, competent, good judgment, compassion when needed. Mm -hmm. None of those things were actually apparent, uh, but that's what we had to do to make the show work. And so we created that narrative, made it seem like it was money, like he was living in royalty, yeah. with the, the, the cars and the limousines and the helicopter all labeled Trump, and golded, um, gilded, like the gilded New York age, and then had to position him as a great uh, potential CEO. Yeah. And I say potential because he never really was a That's CEO. Right. He was a lot of little businesses that he had. Yeah. But they would, to make the show work, we had to make it seem like that. And unfortunately, that because we just pummeled American with those messages, yeah. that remains there right now. And to many people, even though there is significant things that you can see right right now that is that where that's not true, many people think it is. And and right now with the uh, economy being one of those things that people are looking at, we made him think seem to be a very smart businessman. Yeah. And quite honestly, that is not true because he wouldn't wouldn't have four bankruptcies and then ultimately six during the time of Apprentice if he was that good. Right. And I mean, look, Mark Cuban is, is on a, is on a TV show, but that's because he's judging other businesses and he's a very successful yes. businessman and really genuinely rich. But Tim, we've talked about this a lot. Donald Trump was not as rich as he said he was. Right. He was definitely not that successful. His company was just a little series of LLCs. He doesn't even own most of the buildings with the word Trump on them. Talk about the real Donald Trump. And what do you think was the damage done by people really genuinely believing that Trump really was successful. Well, I mean, I think The Apprentice was his ticket into the White House. Absolutely. But prior to The Apprentice, he was this punchline of jokes about the excesses of the 1980s. He was out in the tundra. No one did big deals with him. He was an afterthought on comedy shows. He was this sort of subject of ridicule, and New Yorkers knew him as like, one of the sort of dirigibles you float above the city as a feature of New York life, but he wasn't a major real estate developer. The real estate community shunned him. And he had this very fortunate intersection with Mark Burnett. Mm -hmm. And Mark Burnett, who was an immigrant, was selling blue jeans in California and read Art of the Deal. And it was like his Bible to the American dream. And he always thought, he told me this, that, that he would one day do a show that embodied the spirit of the art of the deal. But remember, the art of the deal itself is a book. It's a nonfiction yeah. work of fiction. That Trump it's, didn't even write. He didn't even write it, and the whole thing is full of errors and mythologizing and presenting him as a great deal maker when he wasn't a great deal maker. He routinely got taken to the cleaners by other deal makers. He overpaid, he went into debt, yeah. he went into bankruptcy, and then the apprentice rolls around via Mark Burnett. And he gets recreated as this entrepreneurial guru to the masses, when in fact he was a serial bankruptcy artist. Uh, as you know, as John noted, his real office in Trump Tower was like this relic of the 1980s: shag carpeting, you know, crummy furniture. I heard the exact same thing when I wrote my book, Man Who Sold America. I interviewed somebody who was a contestant on one of the seasons of The Apprentice, who said it was kind of shocking to see how shabby the the boardroom was in the real Trump Tower. And, and he still wears the same suits and ties and shirts that he wore in that. <laughs> that are down to his knees, yeah. like he's a you know a, a church deacon from the 1980s. Yeah, like baked in amber yeah. of that era. And I think that that the 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 myth of him 
being a an unusually gifted businessman is what sold him to voters yeah. in 2016. Yeah, and they still do. You still hear people say, well, I'm going to vote for him because he's a businessman and understands yeah. the economy. Let's play a clip from The Apprentice. This is one of the sort of moments when he sort of showed who he really is, uh, the vile person that he is. Here it is. I, at this point, am the team chooser, not the team leader Excuse yet. Excuse me, you dropped to your knees. Yes. And begged to do this. And I said, I'm looking around the room, and we had even Latoya, who sitting beside me, thought maybe Brandy was right. Must be a pretty picture you dropped Little in John your knees. I mean, that's, that's, that, that was a, a glimpse at of, yeah, of the real him. That, that got into the Celebrity Apprentice at that point, um, <laughs> where it sort of got into the later seasons. But he didn't do quite that as much to people that he didn't know. To, sometimes the celebrities, he could do that a little harder. But um, going back to the casting, the, the, the reason that Donald Trump got cast, because almost no other CEO would do it. They did have right. a thought of doing some with other CEOs. Sure. Because um, they didn't have the time, because they had real jobs and money. Right. And, the, the, and the, dignity. Yeah, he had, well, he and had. he needed a, the he, money, right? He, 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 at that point, because he was bankrupt, yes. And he made most of his money off the integrations of the shows. And um, the black versus white thing, when he told me about that, I had to, I basically had to think about how do I do it? Because you don't, you don't want to make him mad. But the right. same token, I had to say, what are you, crazy? Yeah. So the, what I did was I said, you know, I can see why you think that would be a noisy idea because everybody would be talking about it. You right. know, headlines everywhere. Was but, the idea that he thought it would prove some sort of racial superiority of white people? That probably was. For and sure. then, then I, I said, you're going to lose money because you make most of your money off the integrations and there's not going to be a company that's going to want to touch that. And what would he have done if the black team had won? He probably would have had a complete meltdown. Uh, you know, the other piece about it is that he's also he benefits from a, a level of sycophancy that I think most people can't imagine ever having to deal with in their real life. This is Stephen Miller, the architect of his child separation policy, commenting on his performance at the Al Smith Center. That was the single best comedy performance of any president or candidate for president in history. But what made his comedy set even more extraordinary was the jokes were politically devastating for Kamala. He absolutely crushed the Democrats tonight. <laughs> he, he did the same thing about the Bloomberg interview, the disastrous Bloomberg interview in which he couldn't even explain tariffs. And he said it was the greatest live interview any political leader or politician has done on the economy in our lifetimes, period. I mean, it, he has people doing that for him well, all the time. Be, because to survive in his orbit, you have to, do you have to kiss the ring. Yeah. And, and, and he tends to attract C-minus people. He's, yeah, he, that guy definitely is that. Yeah, and I think, you know, in both his business life and political life, he has never had first-rate people who are much sought-after talents. What he has are people who either think they can take advantage of him, they usually are proven wrong, uh, or they're people who are just sub-level and they think that they can get into the spotlight and ride his coattails, yeah. and they know that to stay there, they've got to bend him. the yeah, knee, the, kiss he, the he, ring. He, he is the single most easy person to manipulate that I've ever worked with. Wow. Um, and quite honestly, the, the easiest thing, he has an unfillable hole for compliments. People that would make anybody blush and say, oh, no, no, too much, that never happens to him. So you can do it in grand uh, doses, and when you do that, he is, you're a genius. Yeah. And he called me many times a genius. I, I'm a good marketer. I don't know if I'm a genius. Yeah. But then if you <laughs> disagree with him, you're an idiot. And I don't think I'm an idiot, idiot either. Yeah. Maybe not somewhere in between. Yeah. But quite honestly, it was black or white with him. Yeah, and he does it now where he, you know, to try to explain, he tries to say, well, no one wants to work with Kamala Harris and no one wants to work with her. But most of the people who worked with him don't want anything to do with his new campaign. But he says, oh, well, they were terrible people. I fired them because they were awful, right? Like he can never. Yes. But the fact is, she's attracted to her campaign some of the best political Liz operatives Cheney, in, Dick the, Cheney, and in the country <laughs> and Republicans. So Absolutely. That math doesn't did, work. Well, and, did and, it surprise you when the, the the gimmick that made him famous made him president, <laughs> that he became president? Yes, well, it became, it was less surprising than disturbing yeah. because I knew I was complicit in it. Yeah. And that's that was um, difficult to do. And the reason that I'm coming forward now First off, I was an executive for a long time, and I really couldn't speak up at that point. I retired a couple of years ago, and I said, well, a few, few weeks ago, I said, what can I do? And I said, I have to tell this story, because I hope it's not too late, but <laughs> I helped pull the wool over America's eyes towards a guy that should not be president, should never be president, and should be fired yeah. from, the, from the whole thing. You know who says the same thing? Tony Schwartz, the guy who really wrote Art of the Deal. And Deep, Tony has a lot of guilt. About and he, he's, he said exactly the same thing, sitting yeah. exactly where you're sitting on this set. Uh, John D. Miller, thank you so much, and I appreciate you coming forward, truly. Tim O'Brien, my friend, thank you. We Thanks, appreciate Joy. you always. Political campaigns love micro-targeting. That's sending messages directly to small groups of voters.
If you're not in the group being targeted, you may never see them. Let's look at what you're missing. Here are some recent political ads that were micro-targeted to Muslim voters in the swing state of Michigan. Vice President Harris has chosen a side, her right side. Harris has made herself clear. She stands with Israel and the Jewish people. And Joanne Kamala will be her husband and top advisor, Doug Emhoff, who would be the first Jewish presidential spouse ever. Kamala relies on her husband, Doug, for counsel on the toughest issues, like Israel's noble fight against the radical terrorists in Gaza. And when Doug talks, Kamala listens. Kamala and Doug, America's pro-Israel power couple. That went to Muslim swing voters. Now, that's extremely cynical and I think kind of anti-Semitic, like there's a Jewish puppet behind the woman. Okay, that's one set of micro-target ads to Muslim voters. Now, here are some other ads run by the same pro-Trump pack being targeted to Jewish voters in the swing state of Pennsylvania. Two-faced Kamala Harris is secretly campaigning for Palestine and trying to get away with it. In Jewish communities throughout America, questions are being asked. Why is she running ads pandering to Palestine? We must stand up to anti-Semitism. We say no more. Kamala Harris, stop pandering to Palestine and stand with our ally Israel. Wait, we were just told Kamala Harris stands with Israel, that she's super pro-Israel. She's part of a pro-Israel power couple. Now we're being told she stands with Palestine against Israel. You see the issue here, right? Those two sets of ads can't both be true. They're diametrically opposed and mutually exclusive, but they're both made by the same pro-Trump political action committee to micro-target and manipulate vastly different groups of voters. It is the grossest, most cynical ploy I've seen in an election cycle that's rotten with cynical ploys. And it's all made possible by the world's richest man, Elon Musk who has given $75 million to the super PAC that's bankrolling all of those micro-targeting campaigns. Musk is just one of three billionaires, three people total, one, two, three, who taken together have poured $220 million into efforts to elect Donald Trump. But Musk is unique and uniquely dangerous because remember, he bought the website formerly known as Twitter. He made it an absolute vector of disinformation and neo-Nazi bigotry, which he sometimes personally reposts and inter interacts with, all in the name ostensibly of free speech. But of course, this free speech warrior is now banning reporters and blocking links to news the Trump campaign doesn't like, multiple sources tell the New York Times. And now the tech tycoon is offering $100 to any registered voter in Pennsylvania who signs onto his petition in support of the First and Second Amendments. Critics say Musk's scheme doesn't quite break the many laws that forbid bri bribing voters, but it sure does bend them pretty hard. And then yesterday, the SpaceX owner hit the campaign trail himself, just side of, outside of Philadelphia. He offered up a heaping helping of election denial. A lot of people on the Dem side will say, there's no cheating, there's no cheating. And I'm like, You're, you've made it impossible to actually prove that, it's, that, that there's cheating. But the, statistically, there are some very strange things that happen that, uh, that, that are statistically incredibly unlikely. Um, so... You know, there's always a sort of question of, like, say, the Dominion voting machines. It, it is weird that the, you know, I, I think they're used in Philadelphia and in Maricopa County, um, but not in a lot of other places. Doesn't that seem like a heck of a coincidence? Okay. A few things here. Everything Musk said there about Dominion voting machines is just flatly untrue. As the company pointed out in a statement yesterday, and as we all learned last year when, let's remember, Fox News had to pay Dominion $788 million to settle a defamation lawsuit after repeating Trump's lies about the voting machine company. Trump also used his rally to bond with fellow paranoid conspiracy believers. Do you think there is a shadow government behind the Biden-Harris administration? I, I mean, it's, and, well, let me put it this way. It's not Biden. Well, who you, uh, is it like, that's behind him? We know Obama, okay, but Obama... I mean, I, I'm just as curious as you are. Um, you know, it, it is, it is uh, as far as I can determine, there isn't any one sort of puppet master. It, it's more like there's a thousand or, I don't know, a lot. But it's, it's just obvious that, that Biden's not in charge. It's obvious that Kamala's not in charge. I mean, the, the, the Kamala's, they just replaced the, the Biden puppet with the Kamala puppet. 
um, very obviously. So, I, I mean, I, yeah, I, I think there's, it's not, from what I can tell, it's not one puppet master, it's many, but, uh, you know, um, it's interesting to see the crossover between the Epstein client list and Kamala's puppet masters. Okay, a few things here. One, it's not a shadow government, it's the actual government. Like, they, they're just, he's the, Biden's the president, Kamala Harris is the vice president. That's the government. Number two, okay, I will give him this. The man is a supernova of charisma. I mean, just, you, just an incredible stage presence. And finally, it's pretty unnerving that the richest man in the world is just casually suggesting that there's some unseen puppet masters who control our government and hung out with Jeffrey Epstein. That's a little loud even for a dog whistle. This level of cynical brain rot political programming out of what America's confirmed top elites, a globalist himself who's from another country, is pretty much unprecedented. I mean, sure, you had Henry Ford palling around with fascists back in the 1920s and 30s and publishing absolute filth, anti-Semitic bilge. But Musk has wealth and access that Ford can only dream of. The richest man in the world has become a raving reactionary, and he's partnering with Donald Trump, the guy who wants to overthrow American democracy. And Musk is doing everything in his power to get that guy elected, from bankrolling lies to reposting racist conspiracy theories to even working a stage in his own absolutely unbearably awkward way. What exactly is Musk expecting in return? Teddy Schleifer is a New York Times reporter covering campaign finance and the influence of billionaires in American politics. He's covered Elon Musk's role in this election at length, and he joins me now. Teddy, your reporting on this has been great. Before we even get to Musk, I just want to start with just noting, uh, this came to my attention, I think, something you noted, that Mary Maddelson, who's Sheldon Adelson's widow, Rick Uhlein, Uhlein uh, who's a sort of manufacturing industrialist in the Midwest, and Musk, just the three of them putting up $220 million, is that right? Yeah, and that's just in the uh, third quarter of this year. And that's just what we know about. There's, we don't know about kind of any contributions that were made to dark money organizations. Look, Democrats have billionaires too, but I do totally. feel like the Republican billionaires, um, it's a very concentrated group of people. And part of that is because of the guy leading the Republican ticket. You know, there are plenty of, of wealthy, you know, center-right, pro-Israel, uh, tax cuts, tax cuts, tax cuts, Republican wealthy people. Um, they are obviously not the... Uh, primary audience uh, at, a, at a Trump rally. And so the types of people who are donors who have rallied around Donald Trump, it's a peculiar bunch. It, it's people like Miriam Adelson who have one issue they really care about, or it's people like Elon Musk who just kind of want to be in the room. And the Elon Musk thing, I mean, again, American history is long, and we've gone through really interesting periods, and you sort of famously in the late 19th century. You know, there was no finance, campaign finance uh, uh, regulation, really. In fact, lots of it came about because of how blatantly corrupt the relationships would be between robber barons and politicians, essentially sponsorship. It's just hard to find something quite like the precedent here of the richest man in the entire country fully, like, completely behind one of the major party nominees to the point that Musk is. Sure. I mean, I was at that event you showed yesterday outside of uh, Philadelphia, and, like, I was sitting there wondering, why is this event happening? Um, you know, clearly, Elon is there, um, you know, in, in, in purpose to encourage people to register to vote in Pennsylvania. That's the state that he really cares the most about. He's basically moved his operations there. The voter registration deadline is Monday. So the, the one way to think about why he's there is because he's trying to kind of create an earned media moment, right, get people to show up, get people to cover it. I'm sure some folks um, registered. Uh, to right. vote because of that event. No, he's campaigning. Uh, another, yeah. an another reason, though, and, and this is something you do not see Dick Uline do or Miriam Adelson do or Reid Hoffman do or any other kind of billionaire, uh, is sometimes you think Elon Musk is the candidate. Um, you know, yes. he came out to uh, a song I've heard at plenty of Trump rallies. You can see right now on the screen, he was standing in front of this massive American flag at the town hall. You know, he was weighing in on to tons of the topics that enough, you know, he would go over 10 minutes at a time without talking about Donald Trump. It's like, Elon, what do you think about AI? Elon, what do you think about Neuralink? It almost reminds me of like a book author doing a talk, um, which is fine, but like yeah. I, I was baffled why this event was happening. Um, and Elon was clearly entertained, you know, it, he had to deal with unruly, you know, activists, and he was, it's, he was doing all the politician stuff who does a town hall in New Hampshire. The law is called the Alien Enemies Act of 1798, and Trump wants to use it to round up, imprison, and deport more than 11 million people. 
Immediately upon taking the oath of office, I will launch the largest deportation program in American history. I have no choice. I will rescue every town across America that's been invaded and conquered, and I will put these vicious and bloodthirsty criminals in jail or kick them the hell out of our country, which is my number one choice. I will invoke the Alien Enemies Act of 1798. That's where we had to go to target and dismantle every migrant criminal network operating on American soil. That was Donald Trump just 25 minutes ago tonight. Think about what Trump is proposing would really look like. Millions and millions of people ripped from the streets and their homes by law enforcement all across the country. And I know Trump tries to make that sound more reasonable by saying that the people he would be targeting are criminals. But the thing to keep in mind there is that Trump thinks that all immigrants he doesn't like are criminals. Here he was last week talking about Haitian immigrants in Spring Springfield, Ohio, whom he knows are in America legally. I mean, look at Springfield, where 30,000 illegal immigrants are dropped, and, and it was they may have done it through a certain uh, little uh, trick, but they are illegal immigrants as yeah. far as I'm concerned. They're illegal immigrants because Donald Trump feels like they should be illegal immigrants. That little trick, that made them actual legal immigrants. Whether it's the press or his political enemies or immigrants, the pattern here is exactly the same. Donald Trump <clears throat> is planning to use the powers of the United States government, the military, the police, the Justice Department, you name it, to go after any person or group that he perceives as his enemy, whether or not they've actually done anything wrong. And he's not being shy about it. In fact, he's campaigning about it out in the open. As Ann Applebaum writes today in The Atlantic, Donald Trump is speaking like Hitler, Stalin, and Mussolini for a reason. Because he and his campaign team believe that by using the tactics of the 1930s, they can win. We pledge to you that we will root out the communists, Marxists, fascists, and the radical left thugs that live like vermin. They're poisoning the blood of our country. That's what they've done. They poison. People are coming in with disease. People are coming in with with every possible thing that you can have. What's happening to our country is we're just destroying the fabric of life in our country, and we're not going to take it any longer. And you got to get rid of these people. If I don't get elected, it's going to be a bloodbath for the whole. That's going to be the least of it. It's going to be a bloodbath. He says, you're not going to be a dictator, are you? I said, no, 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 other than day one. Joining me now, Ruth ben Giat and Jason Stanley. Ruth is a professor of history at NYU who writes about fascism, authoritarianism, and propaganda. Jason is a professor of philosophy at Yale who's written several books about uh, fascism and propaganda. Good evening to both of you. Thank you for, uh, for being here. Ruth, it's, it's escalating. Um, you, uh, you, you posted a tweet the other day because Donald Trump was in uh, Oaks, Pennsylvania on Monday in front of a sign that read, Trump was right about everything. And you posted a tweet in which it said, this is totally fascist. Mussolini's slogan was, Mussolini is always right. And you, you've got it in Italian there as well. Here he is it on a building uh, advertising an exhibition on, uh, uh, on autar autarky, which I guess is like autocracy? I don't know. So, yes, it's, uh, autarky is like self-sufficiency. Uh, Italy first. Ah. Um, and uh, and this was, uh, you know, Mussolini putting Italy first uh, and and getting rid of foreign influence. And that included, uh, you know, Jews who were tagged as foreign influence. And so, you know, everything that we've seen in these clips Trump doing has has been done by the fascists. Um, and even before Hitler came into power, Mussolini was talking about vermin and rodents who bring Bolshevism and Marxism and diseases into Italy. And then when he could declare dictatorship, he, he had penal colonies and concentration camps inside Italy. And who was in there? The same groups that uh, Donald Trump talks about. Uh, the left, you know, the Marxists and even priests, if you were a socialist priest or a progressive priest, LGBTQ people. Uh, immigrants, and he complained about black and brown and yellow people, in his words, having too many babies. 
all the same playbook. Um, and and so it's very, very disturbing uh, that Trump is doing this. And of course, he, he's got a, a reason he's doing this right before the election to create a sense of dread in people and fear, because that's what he preys upon. That's what he needs for people to uh, feel that he is the answer. Jason, I'm in Arizona tonight, and uh, obviously when you're in a swing state, all the advertising at this point close to an election is about the election. Uh, the, the number of ads that I heard that were taken over by, by third-party groups or, or PACs about immigration, about the stuff that Ruth is talking about, uh, in, in the 20-minute drive between the hotel and the studio, I, 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 I'm—, I'm I, it instills fear in you. It instills anxiety because uh, because they just they warn you about all the horrible things that are happening, even if they're not happening to you or you don't experience them. This has worked for decades, probably for centuries and millennia, and it still works. And I'm kind of wondering, Jason, why are we not more sophisticated than we were in the 30s when when Hitler and Mussolini was doing were doing this, or or in times before that? Just to bracket Ruth's comments with Hitler versus Mussolini, in Mein Kampf, uh, Hitler talks about he openly admires America's extremely res restrictive immigration, particularly, he says, uh, its focus on healthy uh, immigrants, meaning uh, racially healthy immigrants. So this is really straight out of Mein Kampf, the parts where Hitler is talking about uh, American immigration uh, and American restrictions on non-white immigration. And really, I think the philosophical question, as a philosopher, uh, what I wonder and what I ask is, uh, why aren't people more alarmed? Why aren't people mm -hmm. more alarmed by the rhetoric that we're seeing? This would have been disqualifying in 2016. But, and we've read this again and again about the history of fascism. We read that this from Victor Klemper's work on the, the language of, fat, of Nazism. It becomes normalized. You become inured mm -hmm. to it. And the function of this uh, normalization is to normalize the practices. Now the rhetoric has been normalized. The next move, history tells us, is for this rhetoric to normalize the practices. It, it goes into action. And, and Ruth, this is interesting because you certainly uh, on your on your social media feeds and in your your uh, newsletter, you warn of these things. You, you sort of have a, a like a, a running commentary about the fact that don't let this be normalized. This is really unusual. And by the way, these are the historical um, you know precedents to what Donald Trump is doing. But do you feel like it's gotten away from you? We have just like I said, we treat it like it's Friday when Donald Trump says crazy things like he's going to ask Rupert Murdoch to make sure that there are no commercials that are against him for the next, uh, he called it three weeks, less than three weeks to the election. I don't know if it's gotten away because all we can do is continue to call it out and continue to, to ask, to not only talk about the what, but talk about the why. So for example, um, and this, and you can talk about historical antecedents for this, but you know, what Trump has been doing is to um, change the perception of violence in America. And that's what the fascists had to do. You've got to make violence in order to get people to buy into the violence that you intend to wage on your own population. You have to get violence to seem something that is uh, morally necessary and even patriotic, as with the thugs who bashed the heads of Capitol Police on January 6th. Now they're patriots. And so Trump has invested a huge amount of time and effort in changing this perception of violence. The other thing you have to do is get people beyond polarization into what I call survivalism. So it's not just me versus you and we're going to agree to disagree. It's me or you and only one of us is going to survive because the enemy is within, it's in the heartland, and the enemy is savage. It eats cats and dogs, it eats your pets and cannibals. And so you literally will not survive if not for Trump. And he's been giving this uh, message for a long time, but he's hugely escalated it now. So we can continue to call it out and call out the devices and why it's being done the way it is and um, educate people. That's that's what I've what? tried to do for years now. <laughs> Which you, you do, and, you, and it's, it's important work. And you've pointed out, for instance, that Donald Trump says, I am your retribution. Uh, uh, Mussolini was your avenger. Uh, so it's the same concept. Jason, I, I, I do wonder about 
fascism, right? When we, we talk about the word, you saw uh, Charlemagne the God saying to, to uh, Kamala Harris, why can't we just use the word fascism? General Mark Milley in Bob Woodward's new book saying uh, Donald Trump is a fascist to the core. This is a, a military man. Uh, tell me about the use of the word fascism. Too early, too soon, too much, too little, too late. Should we be having this discussion? Because it does seem so far removed from our experience as American citizens that I think some people don't take it seriously and make it feel like it's uh, you're being a little crazy by saying it. It's far and away. It, it's far past time to label this what it is. And what we're seeing is a fascist social and political movement. There are many varieties of, of authoritarianism. Uh, the kind of authoritarianism that vilifies LGBTQ uh, plus citizens, that that is based around immigration and immigrants as criminals and vermin, that labels any supporter of democracy with a small d as a Marxist, that claims that Marxists are controlling the institutions and says that we need violence to root them out. Uh, the kind of extortion that we're seeing, essentially Trump is saying, uh, if you don't elect me, this country is going to plunge into violence. When he says bloodshed, what does he mean? One of the things he means is he's encouraging his supporters uh, to plunge the country into violence. That's a kind of extortion that we're familiar from our fascist past. So authoritarianism doesn't identify the target narrowly enough. Uh, what we're dealing with now is fascism. And let me tell you something about the rhetoric that we're, we're seeing. Uh, in Rwanda, before the genocide, they called Tutsi snakes and cockroaches. Uh, snakes yep. Were, were it was a point of honor to be given a machete to kill a snake. So what you were saying is you were justifying killing uh, Tutsis with machetes by calling them snakes. So, so think about calling immigrants vermin. You know, this isn't one of those elections where we're talking much about third party candidates. We don't think they're out there, but they are. RFK is still on the ballot in Wisconsin. Jill Stein is still on the ballot in Pennsylvania and Michigan. Should these candidates be worried about it? Yes, because this may come down to a couple thousand people in Michigan, right? And if Jill Stein can capture a couple thousand people in Michigan, RFK Jr. can capture a couple thousand people in Michigan, they can upset the apple cart and determine the election. I've been covering this on my show for three years now, and I think people have underestimated the impact of RFK, not to win, not even to attract a majority of independents, right? He's attracting a radical, specific group of people, same kind of people that attract Jill Stein, that might be enough to tip one or two swing states. That's the threat that they present. Most independents want an alternative. They don't want RFK. They don't want Jill Stein. They are not real independents. But these people fill a void for a certain group of people. Right now, Stein's people have overtly said their objective is to beat Kamala Harris. Right. If you want to beat Kamala Harris, you want to throw a wrench in the system, you want to protest Gaza, you want to do any number of things, Jill Stein is here for you. But most of all, they are the candidates not of independence, but of people like Putin, of Trump, mm. and of disruption. Mm. Samantha, what do you think? Well, I, I suppose I beg the question, like, what do you do? What do you do if you're Kamala Harris or... Uh, with the, you do ex or exactly what she's doing. Yeah. She's revealing Jill Stein. She's running ads against Jill yeah. Stein. They're calling him out and saying, what I've been saying is, if you're a real independent, don't waste your vote. Don't fall for the trick. It's a wasted vote if you, if you put it toward one of these people. I'd be really focused less on the third parties, but more on the, the newer voters that are coming out and, and, and figuring out if they're actually voting for the parties that they, they want to, right? I think, I think one of the bright spots in um, the early voting numbers was the amount of newly registered voters. Mm -hmm. And I think that is a beautiful mm -hmm. bright spot. I, I don't necessarily share your same view that it's as, uh, as dangerous as it, as it is having the third parties on those states, but I could be wrong. No. In Michigan, there, we know there is a large Arab-American voting base. Over 100,000 there voted uncommitted in the Democratic primary. Now, they might not be going out and voting for Donald Trump, but... How concerned should VP Harris be about this group? I think she should be concerned. I'll never forget on 26, uh, 2016, watching the reviews coming in, the reviews. The <laughs> <laughs> it's all, it's all the reviews coming in. Yeah. Yeah. Reviews it's coming all in. theater. Yeah. Yeah. Now, watching the exact number of votes that Hillary Clinton needed to win certain states. They went to Jill Stein. They went to Gary Johnson, I think his name mm -hmm. was. Yep. People oh, yes, it was. And I have to ask, like, What's what is their end game? Like it, it, she doesn't she wants to hurt Kamala, but then what does she want to do? Mm. What do they want to do? I've never figured that out. Disruptor. About. Have power. Some of them want power, well, want they influence, get it, want money. Was... Jill Stein's a grifter. Yeah, I, I was mean, gonna yeah. say, oftentimes you're in the grifter zone yeah. when you That's don't know it. what money is behind you, you don't know what foreign powers. Right. Yeah, I mean I think that uh, 
I think the, the question here about how both campaigns, Harris in particular, can offset those votes is by making sure she has more voters coming out who she knows are going to support her, right? New voters, yes. I mean, they, I'm going to draw a sort of graph here in midair, but if you look at <laughs> turnout over the you know, percentage of people who turn out by age, it sort of goes like this. You have this blip at the beginning when people are like 18, 20, and it's the mm -hmm. first election, then it goes like this, and then it goes up like that, right? And so for a long time, this this end of the spectrum has been the Democratic end, where they, you know, even if they're, they are independents, but they are, have, are liberals mostly, and they vote for Democrats. And so that is where we, Democrats always had troubles, getting those people out. Now, interestingly, this race actually has a lot of support for Harris at the other end of the spectrum, which is good news for her, but she still has a base of people who are less likely to turn out and vote. And so what they, yes, they're doing these ads targeting Stein and revealing her for who she is, mm -hmm. but they also need to make sure they're doing everything in their power to get as many of those people who are even thinking about voting. But when you say a base of people that are less likely to vote. Yeah. Are you just saying that, like, yes, we know the die-hard MAGA fans mm -hmm. are going to vote all day, every day, yesterday, tomorrow, and they're going to go to a rally. But just because her base is not as fervent wearing 16 hats and a flag outside their house, does that mean that her voters are less enthused or, or, or less? No, you I'm talking structurally. That? Structurally, it is less the case that younger people vote than older people. Mm -hmm. And their jobs make it so it's harder for them to get away. They don't know at home. They, they move all the time. And so they have to re-register to vote, and then they forget about doing so. They're not in the habit of voting. They, don't have, they have less income. Like, there are all these factors the that make it so that younger are in the military and people of color are more likely. Yes, and they, they, they just don't know. They don't one, know what to look one for. One of the biggest Google, right. shirts for, uh, Google searches for Gen Z's about voting is what do I wear to vote? Sure. Like they, you have to wear the uniform. <laughs> exactly. Like, they need to know. Really? <laughs> so, yeah, I know exactly. Honestly, it's, you know what, Chris? I, I, I want to cry. <laughs> because you know what I thought she was about to say? Because I just interviewed a bunch of college students who were saying, we can't figure out what the policies are. And I thought you were about to say, no. these young people are interested <laughs> and they just don't know what the policies are. There is, oh and I, I don't mean to be facetious, <laughs> but there are, are a lot of new voters that it, it seems like such a foreign thing to them, right? They don't they don't know the rules of voting, and mm -hmm. this is like, they live in a digital world. They don't like, I have lots of Gen Z's that work <laughs> for me. Pick, no even picking up a phone code call for voting. But they don't they, they, necessarily know that. They're also anticipating the selfie they're going to take. With oh, that's that's what yeah, 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 yeah. I want to look yeah. good. Yeah. 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 Mm. That blows, <laughs> my, mind. That blows I my mind. I have to ask. I, I know, like, people hear Donald, you know, everything Donald Trump says goes in one ear and out the other. But this talk this week of Donald Trump talking about the enemy from within, <gasps> mm. he still does have a lot of support from law enforcement. He still does have a lot of support from people from the military. Do they hear this? Does it, does it make an impact? Yeah, he has a lot of support from a lot of people, but I think he's right about this being the enemy from within, but it's him. Right. I said this on Joy's show earlier this week. He is the number one threat to our national security. He is uh, what General Milley called a fascist, right? From our national security community, they have continued to identify him and what I've called the American surgency that he's created and the propensity for violence, the encouragement of violence, the, the insurrection. He is our number one national security threat, and every national security advisor has said it. You've got General McChrystal, you've got General Milley, you've got General McCra Admiral McRaven. They have all said it. And they're kind of ringing the bell for the American public to say this is more than about politics. This is about our national security, because even if he loses, he is still a major threat to our democracy and to the integrity of this country. So he's right. It's the enemy from within, but it's him. But your, your, your point about the police is well taken. I mean, I looked at the data, I think, after the 2020 election, there was a big spike in the number of contributions from people who said they worked for police department or identified themselves as police officers or, or uh, 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 you know, captains, and so on and so forth, who were donating to Republicans and to Trump in particular. He's been very active about reaching out to police. Mm -hmm. He's been engaging them. And you see this response. I don't think there's been polling of police specifically. But, yeah, I mean, you know, as, as someone who fits within the enemies within, within category, apparently, since I'm a member of the mainstream media, yeah, I mean, that's not, that's not a good nexus. Right? But it's, after it's, it's January 6th, that's what I don't understand. But it's baked into the party, too. It's generations yeah. of the Republican Party saying we're strong on national security. We care about the police. We care about first responders. The Democrats are making up ground there. But we're talking about a generational messaging push from the Republicans and the brand hasn't yeah, faked right. in.